Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed class. We are officially in the second half. Let me turn this down a little bit. Uh, tonight's class will be focused on driving and hazardous driving conditions. So we're talking about weather. So let's see if we can get some people to join us tonight. So good evening, good evening. seven <clears throat> we're only missing one person so just gonna wait just a moment um, so let me take a look at my phone here and see who do we have why is it always males it's always males that are lagging behind female students are always sits in the front of the class always on time doing their homework guys i guess we're just procrastinators so i'm uh, pretty happy with the test scores don't be too discouraged if you didn't do as well as you thought you were going to do i do know that um, it was a little bit confusing with some of the signs uh, i did that intentionally uh, i knew that you would know your basic signs you know, the square, circle, inverted triangle, pennant, stuff like that. So I decided to uh, throw some signs in there that would make you really think twice. Uh, remember, with a multiple choice test, it's always uh, the process of elimination. So that's what I wanted you to be uh, focused on. Because when you're driving, you're going to see signs that you've never seen before. And you're not going to have time to, uh, you know, stop in the middle of traffic. You're going to have to process it by color, by shape, by symbol, and then try to figure out what it's communicating to you. And sometimes you get it wrong, even on the road. So like I said, don't be too um, discouraged that uh, things didn't um, come out the way that you want. Um, I do have a few drive times for tomorrow and Saturday. I think I have uh, 11 o'clock tomorrow, and I have Saturday, maybe 12 o'clock. So if you could drive tomorrow or Saturday, uh, just let me know. I'm not going to be driving in the afternoon on either of those days. So till about 12 or 1, that's going to probably be my uh, shutoff time. Uh, is there anything else that we need to go over before we get going? I don't think so. Now, we're entering our winter months, the worst driving conditions that you're ever going to be faced with. Um, and you're going to probably even possibly have your license uh, before you get any experience. Let me turn off the double mic. It always happens. I should know better. So you're going to be getting your license and not having any either instruction from me or probably from your parents. So you're going to be doing this on your own. So take good notes tonight. I really think that what we cover will help you. Yeah, I know the echo. Thanks. I saw the double mic. So let me just turn things down just a little bit and see if that helps too. So let me know if the um, echo goes away. So I'm going to just wait for a minute. See if someone will give me a text message or put in a comment. Yeah, it's really tough. I don't know why it does echo, why it triggers the built-in microphone from the computer, because I really do like the mic that I have in front of me. So let's take a look at this picture. It says, what a mess. This was taken from the Boston Globe um, probably about 10 years ago. And this is just south of Foxborough Stadium where the Patriots play. If you take a quick look at the picture, and you've got probably eight or nine cars that we can see. 
If we look real quick, we can probably see six or seven tractor trailers. So we know it's a massive pileup on 95. And the question that I have for you is that, what caused that? Now we know it's slippery services, so we know it's traction. But let's just take it a little bit deeper. What really would cause a crash like this in the winter time? Because the minute you get snow on the, on the ground, does that mean that every time that you drive, you're gonna crash your car? So is it going to be only on certain snowstorms or is there a certain depth to the snow? What causes a car to lose contact with the roadway and to skid out of control and hit other cars? Okay, I want you to write this down. All your crashes in bad weather can be con um, attributed to, to two things. So write this down. Speed is number one, all right? If you're driving too fast, you are going to lose contact in snow, ice, sleet, rain. You're going to have issues, major issues. So that's to start off the discussion that in bad weather, your speed has to be suited for where you have traction. Um, I always tell people, think of, think of a pendulum, um, you know, a pendulum. Or the scale, or scale. Let's do a scale. So, at at here, basically, when we have it like this, we're we're leveled, and we have equal on both sides. Okay, we're going to be in control when we're like this. When you start adding speed, okay, it tips the scale. Right. So you've got to you've got to realize that when you're driving, when is your speed tipping the scale of control? When are you actually starting to lose. You're going to start to feel it when you drive. You, you, you're you not going to believe it, but it, you're going to actually feel the car move like two or three inches and you can sense, uh-oh, that was not good. Next time it's going to probably be worse. You're going to sense the car not gripping the road and it's pushing your car where you don't want it to go. The other factor is following distance. If you have, let's give the example of driving on the highway at 55. If you're driving 45 on a highway that's supposed to be 55 and you see cars in front of you slipping and sliding, that's telling you you probably shouldn't be going at that speed because as you get up to where they are, there are probably patches on the, on the pavement underneath the snow that's solid ice and they're having issues trying to get up. So just realize the cars in front of you are giving you information of what you're going to be doing with your speed and your position. So speed is number one, following distance is number two. So if you always have those two things, you're not going to hit people. You're not going to be involved in a crash like this. So all these cars, if they were losing control at 45, they probably should have been driving 35. And if they were two car lengths or two seconds, three seconds, then they should have been four, five, or six. Because more time that you have with the vehicles that are in front of you, of course, you're going to have more time to respond to losing control of your vehicle. So let's talk about winter weather. Let's An expressway slick with ice, black ice, thin, nearly invisible to drivers. The ice has caused a car to crash in the fast lane. Trooper Jeff Oaken parks his cruiser to prevent a pileup. But behind him, drivers are approaching way too fast. Okay, what happened? The guy probably hit the cruiser. Um, there are three different types of winter weather. So write this down. Ice, sleet, and snow. And that's from severity. Ice, by far, is the worst weather condition to drive in. If you've ever walked on a skating rink or a pond, a frozen pond or a lake, and your shoes are a little bit warm, you're not getting any traction. You can barely take a step. I always find it funny when people go out to throw a puck in a hockey game and they walk out and they and they just shuffle their feet because at any moment they're going to lose contact uh, with the roadway, uh, roadway with the uh, ice rink, and they're going to slip and slide and fall. Uh, so let's talk about ice for a minute. 
Um, I'm going to show you this video at the end, but I, I want to kind of get through. And this is what I put for a picture uh, for tonight's class. Drivers ignoring winter conditions may be subject to natural selection. That is so true. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't learn in driver's ed, you're going to be subject to this. Okay. Unfortunately, it it's true. Good drivers, just like the cream rises to the top. Good drivers uh, survive winter driving without any issues. Those that are kind of uh, suspect in dry weather in summertime driving, come winter time, you can see them out on the road and you go, "Yep, those are our bad drivers." Okay, they all they all come out in the winter time. So let's break this down. Okay, first thing I want you to write down: ice is usually found off to the right side of the road. We know ice is frozen water. Um, ice can get on the road many ways. It could be snow that's thawing and then freezes in the middle of the night, or it could rain, and as temperature drops, like tonight, they said there may be a frost. So in the morning, we could have maybe some wet areas, you know. That frost could be kind of thick and frozen up a little bit, it could get a little bit slippery. It won't last too long, probably a half hour or so. Um, but we find it more off to the right side of the road near the white line because water drains to the right. And once it pools there, it freezes, and that's where you're going to see your issues of, of black ice. And black ice takes on the resemblance of the color of the pavement. That's where you get the term black ice. So you look down the road, and you think it's perfectly fine, but in reality, it's not. Now, you're going to have to learn by watching the vehicles in front of you. So if you see cars spinning their wheels or slipping or sliding just beyond their stop line, then you know black ice is evident. It's there. And black ice is more apt to happen in the morning because as the sun rises, the uh, sun will thaw the road, and it usually gets warmer. So write down in your notes, black ice um, will be more of a problem in the uh, morning, okay? It can be an issue at night it, because you don't see the road as well. Uh, it does get colder, so probably early morning and then at the beginning of, of, of nightfall. It is only a traction problem. Ice is not a vision problem. You can see the road perfectly fine, okay? So ice is only a traction problem. Now, if you know it's slippery to the right, then you're going to move to the left, of your lane. You're going to move left of center when you drive. Okay. And the biggest question that most people will have is like, if I know the road is super slippery with black ice, how fast should I go? Maximum speed, write this down, should never be over 15 miles per hour. Why 15? There, is there anything magical about 15? Yes. I think I might have mentioned this earlier last week. Remember, airbags only deploy at speed limits of 15 miles per hour or faster. So if you're going 10, 12 miles per hour, are you going to do serious damage to other people's vehicle? Probably not. That's what we call a fender bender. But the airbag will come out if you're going 16, 17, 18 miles per hour. So you're still going to have the damage but also you're going to have to replace an airbag, all right? It's almost as fast as you can run, all right? Most humans can run around five, six, seven miles per hour. Then if you're really super fast or in the track, you're probably on the higher end, but you're only going to be driving this for a period until you do find yourself getting traction and the, the roads have been treated. But if it's super slippery and you can tell cars are having a hard time, Go extremely slow. That's what ice, it, it formed. Look, it, it came as in the form of rain or sleet, and it attached to the metal speed limit sign and froze solid. But as the sun rose and the metal started to heat up, look at that. It, it's almost like an envelope of ice. It's just slipping right down the sign. And what you see below the speed limit sign, that ice, that is what's on the road. That same thickness is on the road. It has to be broken up. It has to be thawed out. It's going to create 
create problems. I also want you to write this down. This will be a test question on the final, so hint, hint. So if you're paying attention, taking great notes, this is, this is for you. Bridges will freeze first because you have air circulation below the bridge and above the bridge. Cold temperatures. Remember, bridges like the, what you see right here, even though we see pavement, you've got to think beyond that. What's below the pavement? Underneath. It's all metal. Metal will hold temperature a lot longer, a lot easier, so that metal is going to get cold and stay cold. When you have pavement that's just on dirt, you've got that thermal property of the earth that's, that's keeping the pavement relatively warm. Now, once we're in the middle of winter, even on a regular road, it's going to freeze up pretty quick because now even if you've ever tried to take a shovel and, and dig into the dirt, you just can't in the middle of January. But you could probably do it at the end of November, December, even though there's snow in the ground because it hasn't frozen solid yet. So let's talk about the next type of winter weather, and that's called sleet. And that's rain that's freezing on the way down. And how does it differ from ice? Ice is usually thicker, and like I said, it's from the melting of snow or the pooling of water, rain that freezes um, at night. Sleet is coming down, okay? It comes from above. So it becomes a traction and a vision problem because just like we saw in that speed limit sign, it's, it's going to coat the roadway and coat your windows. This is why we have defrosters in our car. And this is why it's so important in state inspection that they actually test to make sure that you're getting warm air coming out of the defroster. Where should you drive on the road? Probably right of center towards the white line a little bit because most people in bad weather don't want to be uh, close to oncoming traffic. And if you have ever looked at a roadway, even in the rain, the tires of cars in front of you have actually made uh, marks on the road. We call that tire wipes or tire tracks. And you should try to keep your um, tires in those, those grooves in the snow and the sleet where cars in front of you have, have basically driven. And now just like with ice, if ice you're driving at 15 miles per hour or slower, how fast should you drive in sleet? Slightly faster than ice. Probably 20, 25 would be max. Okay, go like cut, cut your speed in half. If it's 30, go 15. 35, 40, go 20, 25. If it's 55, 25, 30. Okay, but making sure that you can feel that you have traction. How about snow? Now, write down in your notes, there are two types of snow. And no one put yellow snow and white snow. I'm not talking about that. Wet snow and dry snow. Those are the two types of snow. Which one is worse to drive in, wet or dry? Hopefully you answered wet snow. Wet snow actually clogs inside the tread of your tires, basically making your tire a slick, which means when you accelerate, they just spin. Now, the slower you make your tires move, you accelerate, the more likelihood you're going to push that snow out of your tread. The faster you drive or the faster you spin your tires, the more you're going to be picking up that snow and spinning your tires. So wet snow is different than dry snow. Wet snow is usually right around the freezing point, right around 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Drier snow, when in the colder temperatures, it, you could almost probably go the same speed limit that is posted in dry snow because it doesn't stick to the road. And the road is so cold, it's not melting and freezing and, and creating any ice slick areas. But that wet snow, it, it is rough. It is tough. And by the way, if some of you don't get all your driving done in October and we go into November, December, I just want to put this out there. If we are to drive, scheduled to drive, and it snows, and it's the first snowfall of the year, I probably won't drive. I'll probably 
you know, text you and cancel. I do not want to be out on the road during the first snowfall. Oh, I trust you. I have no problems driving with you. It's the other people on the road I'm afraid of. There are so many people that do not change their driving behavior uh, during the first week of the first snow. They don't do the things that we're talking about right now. And we have people actually sliding and slipping into where we're driving. So I'm afraid of them, not what you're going to do. So just wanted to throw that out there. And it's usually a wet snow. It's usually a wet snow, the first. And people haven't changed their tires. It's really important um, now till uh, December to start thinking about what do I need to do to my vehicle to get it ready for winter weather. Because you don't want to get caught out in that first snowfall and not have decent tires or a scraper or uh, maybe sand and other things that you want in your vehicle. So always pre-plan, and this is the time to do it. Where should you drive on the road? We already mentioned that. Always in the tire tracks of other cars that have driven in front of you. The speed you should drive, this is all personal preference now. When you get to snow, um, I would say a minimum um, 10 miles below the posted speed limit. You may go five under if it's a dry snow or even drive the regular speed if it's a dry snow. But start with five or 10 miles below the posted speed limit in a wet snow. And a lot has to do, too, is if the road has been treated with salt, sand, and are they actively plowing roads. The other thing that I want to mention about driving in winter weather, especially snow, not so much sleet or ice, I want you to write this down. You should be familiar with the major roads in your area. Now, most of you that have driven with me, you know we drive 108, 155. Those roads will always be your best roads to drive on. So what I want you to write down in your notes is stay to major state routes. Stay away from back roads unless you absolutely have to. Those roads do not get plowed or treated as frequently as your major roads. So by staying on a major road, you're going to have a better chance of having better surface contact with the roadway. And if anything ever goes wrong, you're on a major road where people are going to be driving by and uh, helping you. So now I'll show you the video that I was going to show these people. Okay. And I think it's a European video clip that I found because it looks like a lot of the license plate look like they're from another country. These people have not learned how to drive in bad weather. Now, these people are extreme. So hopefully you'll never find yourself in some of these situations. You're going to be amazed at some of the things that some of these people do. Yeah. 
hear me now. It's so hard because my headphones don't give me the sound for the video. So you, you kind of get the idea of what's happening here. They're all going too fast. They have no clue what, what to do in driving in these different types of winter weather. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was kind of tough. It's so hard. I've got to figure out the button to push to, to talk over the movies. Um, well, I apologize that you weren't able to hear my commentary of what was going on. Basically, what I was trying to say is is that just as we s said earlier on tonight, speed is the real issue here. And they didn't assess the winter weather that they were driving in. And probably the cars weren't equipped too well uh, tire-wise to handle what they've done. And they were, they were only making things worse. Um, you can't have that happen. And the cars that were doing 360s, I was trying to explain, that has happened in the driver's ed car a few times. The... I mean, you could try to do everything possibly right, and still you may have problems driving in winter. So don't think you're never going to have a problem. We're trying to minimize it. So uh, I feel pretty you know, proud that my students haven't had any major crashes in the driver's ed car. But we've had some close calls. And driving in the winter, we've been stuck in a snowbank. We've spun the car around 360, as I said before, um, on a major road in downtown Dover. It's happened. But we've never hit another vehicle. We've never hit a pedestrian. So I'm just kind of so thankful that uh, that hasn't happened. Um, when you look at the picture, you're probably thinking, wow. And the reason why I put this picture in the uh, presentation is that I want you to realize the problem you're going to have with snowbanks. And by the way, this picture is Photoshopped. This is not real. Okay? This is not real. But I want you to realize that your vision is going to be adversely affected driving in the winter. So write down in your notes, snow bankings at intersections will create vision problems. You're going to need to understand that you are inching out multiple times before you commit to make a turn. You come to a stop sign. You can't see. That's your legal stop. Okay? You stop where you think the line is, and in the wintertime you may not even see the line. But each time you move up, six inches, and don't try to take a foot, especially in um, real narrow, narrow roadways. And by the way, snow makes roads narrow. When you plow or when they plow, you're going to start losing six inches to a foot on a roadway almost with every storm. So it's going to be hard to see. So do your safety stops before you commit is basically what I'm trying to say. Now, like I said, this is Photoshop, but the next picture is real. This is actually in northern Maine. Okay, so that's a real snowbank. And if you take a look at the tractor trailer, and, the, and it's a good picture to, to see the, uh, the relation, that's probably a snowbank that's at least eight feet high. At least, maybe closer to nine, because it's right at the top of the cap. Okay, so when you get to the next intersection, it's going to be extremely difficult to see. So this was Maine. Upstate Maine, way up north. So let's talk about things that you can do to be better equipped for driving in the winter. First of all, when I say get a feel for the road, I'm talking about get some experience during the first snowfall. Try to convince your parents to take you out to a parking lot and give you 15, 20 minutes of just driving around, hitting the brakes harder than normal, maybe taking a turn on an empty part of the parking lot and see what happens. How does the car respond when I'm on snow or ice? How much do I slide? It's better for you to get a feel what it's like to skid or to lose traction in a parking lot and then try to recover than to have it for the, uh, happen for the first time when you're driving in downtown Durham because that's when you've got to be doing it correctly, reacting correctly. So you can make mistakes in a parking lot, and as long as you're not doing near any light poles, you're not going to hit anybody. Don't do it near parked cars. I would never recommend that. But And I'm not talking about you know spinning your tires and going extremely fast and you know making it look like you're a Yahoo out in the middle of a parking lot. But uh, make it a learning experience. What does it feel like when ABS kicks in? 
What does it feel like when you try to make a turn uh, a little bit faster than you normally do? And everything has to be done different driving in winter. You're braking a lot sooner. Um, so it says brake at least three times your normal stopping distance. I think I'm trying to, to train most of you. Most of you know that when I have you in the car, the minute we know we have a stop sign up ahead or a traffic light, I'm asking you to coast, cover the brake, or brake early. You want to set your mind thinking is that why am I going quickly up to a stop sign? Why am I going quickly up to a traffic light? In the wintertime, you're going to have to have that distance to stop if you don't have traction. You're going to thank um, me that, uh, geez, I'm glad that I learned how to brake early because now that I'm slipping and sliding, I don't feel so nervous because I've got plenty of time to regain control of the car. Tires, we already mentioned, have to be re replaced. You can't have bad tires in the winter. You're just asking for trouble. So make sure you good, have good uh, tire depth. Now, a lot of people think, well, do I need snow tires? Not necessarily. A good all-weather radial tire will do you well. Can you put snow tires? And the snow tires have little metal studs that are, you know, um, imp you know impaled in the, in the rubber. And uh, it's going to help you grip the road. It makes for a rougher ride. It's a louder ride. But you do get better traction. Um, know if your car has ABS. And ABS stands for Anti-Lock Braking System. Make sure that um, the vehicle is in good driving condition. So the brakes have been checked. Um, their frosters have been checked. Uh, warming up your vehicle. Okay. It says clear and warm up the vehicle. It is a law. So write this down. We may have it in another section too, but we'll mention it now. The state of New Hampshire will pull you over and give you a ticket if you have any accumulated snow on the on the on the roof of your vehicle or on the hood or trunk of your vehicle. Anything that could fly off your vehicle and hit another car, you can be given a ticket for. And they just enacted that law like two years ago. So don't be surprised if you get pulled over. A nice officer will make you get out and just you know, take it off the top of your vehicle or all around your vehicle. So when it comes time to leave school, you know, after you get out in the wintertime, take time to clear all that snow off. Don't just think about your windows. Think about the whole vehicle. Uh, watch for danger spots on the road that could be hiding ice. So when you're driving in a uh, wooded area, especially with a lot of pine trees, the sun doesn't penetrate through evergreens. So those roads are going to stay frozen for most of the winter. And carbon monoxide poisoning is where um, exhaust fumes leak back into the passenger compartment of the vehicle. And this can be deadly, especially when your tailpipe is being blocked. So if you're in a parking lot digging out your car, if you're shoveling off snow from the top of your vehicle and it gets piled up off to the back up near your exhaust pipe, just, just dig around it. Because if you don't and you start up the car and warm it up, all that gas and fumes are going to linger inside, inside the car. And it doesn't take long. The studies have shown that if your tailpipe is blocked, within 15 to 20 minutes, you can actually um, uh, put someone to sleep and uh, basically kill them. So they get knocked out, coma first, and then um, because of the uh, levels... Uh, get too high in their body of carbon monoxide, they will die. And I don't think I put the article. I have an article of a young kid that was shoveling snow around his vehicle, and he got inside to rest and uh, kept the car running, and actually he died within like a half hour. Uh, warming up your car, I would recommend doing it for 10 to 15 minutes. The colder the temperature, the longer you're going to warm it up. Make sure that you get heated air on the windows. That's going to keep them clear as you're driving. So that's why defrosters are so important. So let's take a look at some driving tips of driving in the winter. There's also ice. Ice on a roadway isn't like ice in a glass of water. You don't necessarily see it. If it's a sunny day, you can have glare on the road and it just appears that the roadway is wet when actually there, there is ice on the road and it can catch you by surprise. If you have to drive on ice, slow down to a crawl. 
When it's freezing or near freezing, be extra careful on bridges, overpasses, and streets shaded by trees or buildings. These areas tend to freeze before the rest of the roadway and they're the last to thaw out. If it's icy and you approach a curve, slow down before you get to the curve. If you suddenly slow down or speed up while turning, you will go into a skid. Like ice, snow can be deceptive too. Once it starts to pack down and then you have temperature changes where it melts some, freezes, melts some, freezes, then you end up with that icy condition again. And yes, you can see it, but it can still be very deceptive in terms of how slippery it'll actually be. Again, it's essential to slow down. If you're driving in packed snow, cut your speed to half of what you'd normally drive. To increase traction, use snow tires or tire chains placed over the tire tread. Whether you're driving in snow or rain, the American Automobile Association gives seven tips for safer driving. One, prepare in advance. Clean your windows and lights. Check the tread and pressure of your tires. Check your windshield wipers, headlights, and other equipment to make sure they're in good working order. Two, be extra careful. Drive slower and allow extra space between your car and others. Three, drive in the tracks of the vehicle in front of you. Since those tracks are drier than the surrounding pavement, they provide better traction. Four, give plenty of advance notice to other drivers. If you plan to turn or slow down, let other drivers know early enough so that they have time to react safely. Five, be alert. Watch for pedestrians trying to get out of the weather. Six, keep your low beam headlights on. This helps you to see better and helps others to see you. And seven, ease your way into turns or curves, avoiding any sudden starts and stops. A few tips for when you and bad weather meet out on the highway. I'm Ryan Woodring. Okay, uh, one other thing about uh, driving in winter weather, and this is before I show you um, the winter weather school that they offer in the state of New Hampshire. I want you to write this down. You won't find this in a textbook. You won't find this in the manual. This is something um, I have developed, something that I require with my kids. Um, it's very important that you do three things when you're driving in the winter weather. Okay, so I want you to write this down. Your parents should always know where you're at. All right, so write that down, that when you're driving in bad weather, let's say, you're out after school and you decided to go to the mall. Who knows if the mall is open anymore uh, after the pandemic. Um, make sure your parents know where you are. Second thing, make sure your parents know basically if you're going to be driving in snow that what route you're going to be taking to come home. So if you're at the mall, say I'm going to be taking Route 4 you know, back or I'm going to go you know, into Dover first on uh, Route uh, 16 and who you have in the car. There's nothing worse for a parent to get a phone call from another parent and say, I believe your son is driving my son around. They're doing something. Do you know where they are? Now, I don't even know that they were out. I didn't know my your son was with my son. So these are just things that co common courtesy because if anything bad happens, on the way home, you know, let's just say that you're driving your friend home after going to the mall and you have a problem where you, you know, break down or go off the edge of the road. Your parents basically will know what route you are taking and, and then who you've got in the car. Now, I know GPS has find my phone and it's pretty easy now to find people, but every winter, Without fail, we're going to hear stories of someone that goes off the edge of the road and people can't find them for a day or two. It happens. They go too fast on a back road. They leave the roadway. They get you know way down 30, 40 feet off the edge of the road. People just can't see their car because of you know the snow. Maybe the plow comes by and you can't see the entrance into the, into the, the wooded area. But it happens. So just, uh, you know, something your parents will really be happy if you were to show this responsibility of 
where you are, how you're going to get home, and who you got in your car. All right. New Hampshire has three different winter driving schools. It's a little bit different than what you've got here with um, my driving school. They take you out into a course, and they teach you how to use ABS correctly. They teach you how to get out of a skid a little bit more than what we're going to be talking about. We just do the basic principle of always try to keep your back end in front of your front end. Um, they talk about how to actually accelerate sometimes out of a skid on a front wheel drive. That's a little bit more advanced than what we're going to be able to do. And of course, you're going to drive with me your 10 hours and we probably won't have any opportunity to drive in winter weather. So here's the practical part. Uh, this is actually a video from Colorado, I believe, but it's the same thing that we have here in New Hampshire. Like I said, there's about three different uh, winter weather schools that we have. I think they're all north or west of where we're at. I don't believe we have anything closer than Concord. So if you wanted to do this, I think it may help your insurance rates if you take uh, a class like this. So just be advised that it may be worth, and it's not as expensive as driver's ed because they're not doing one-on-one -on -one with you uh, in a car like I am. That's, you know, it's a little bit cheaper because it's only like for four hours, five hours, and they've got a course and multiple, and you're already a licensed driver, so the instructor doesn't have to be in the car with you. He probably does a walkie-talkie radio thing telling you what to do. So here's the driving school. Looking for a new car or truck? TheAutoChannel.com has the most complete and up-to-date pricing, vehicle specifications, and reviews. While driving on ice and snow can be a frightening experience if you're not mentally and physically prepared, there really are no deep, dark secrets to controlling your vehicle in difficult circumstances. The Bridgestone Winter Driving School features purpose-built tracks designed to duplicate the most challenging, real-world driving situations. It is critical to clear all snow and ice from your vehicle, including the roof. Snow left on your roof will quickly obscure the rear window, and when you begin to drive, large chunks of flying snow can block the vision of drivers beside or behind you. To steer smoothly and correctly, place your hands at the 9 and 3 o'clock position on the steering wheel. Keeping your hands on opposite sides of the steering wheel allows you to steer through a corner efficiently and precisely. Do not attempt to deflate your tire to gain a bigger contact patch with the road surface because this will only lessen the performance of your tire. Only a properly inflated tire offers maximum grip. Also, remember tire pressure can change according to the outside temperature. Tire pressures drop 1 psi for every 10 degrees in temperature drop. Also, check your tire pressures regularly to ensure proper inflation. This is especially important in late fall or early winter as temperatures begin to drop. The number one rule of safe winter driving is to adjust your speed to the current conditions. These conditions include the type of tire, road surface, visibility, the type and weight of your vehicle, and your driving ability. With the traction control and stability control systems in today's cars, many people become overconfident or simply complacent. These systems can help drivers by alerting them to improper responses or correcting small mistakes, but they can't overcome the laws of physics. If your car is equipped with standard brakes, the most effective way to stop in an emergency situation is to use the pumping technique. Most drivers are aware of this concept of pumping the brake, but don't really understand the proper technique. Okay, he brought up two good points that I want you to uh, write down in your notes. One is that as temperature drops 10 degrees, you're going to lose one pounds per square inch in your tire. So what does that mean? If your tire pressure needs to be at 34 or 35, and the temperature goes from like 50 to 30, it's going to drop down at least two. Now you're down around 32, all right? So if you haven't checked your tires, you know, now it's around 60, 70 degrees. So we start getting colder temperatures in the morning. You could wake up in the morning and you're going to have five less pounds per square inch and a softer tire. So when your tire number goes down, it becomes a softer tire and it pinches the grooves of your tread. So you're not able to take care of the snow that's on the ground. That's why. The other thing that he talked about is traction control or stability control. 
most cars now are coming equipped with th this. And what this means is that once the uh, the car senses that there's a tire that's not really getting good contact with the roadway, more torque or more tire spin is going to go to the other three tires to help you control the vehicle a little bit more efficiently rather than to continue to give power and spinning to the tire that's losing contact. So that's what that means. Um, stay with the vehicle. Uh, people will get hit or freeze to death if they try to walk for help, especially in an active snowstorm, so I don't recommend that. A uh, red flag, this will probably be a question on the final. Uh, that shows your car is disabled. You have no electrical power. Normally, we would put our hazard lights on to let people, we talked about this, your emergency flashes, tells people that you need help. But if you can't communicate that because your battery's dead or you had a crash and your car's all, you know, cracked up, uh, it's not going to work. So you've got to put something that indicates that you can't move, you need help. Keep passengers warm with blankets. This is especially true if uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is a problem, so crack the window. Keep the engine going long enough to warm people up, but don't waste fuel, meaning that if you get stuck at 10, 11 o'clock at night and you're you know, 30 feet off the edge of the road, you're going to freeze to death if you run out of fuel at 2 in the morning. So, you know, run the engine for a half hour, then, you know, turn it off and you're going to be freezing. But, you know, turn it off for a half hour to an hour, then warm yourself up again and then turn it off. And hopefully you can serve fuel and help will be on the way. Make sure that your phone is uh, fully charged. Have a charger in your car. Uh, don't panic with cell phones now, uh, traffic or Cars will probably come to your aid pretty soon if they can see your vehicle. One of the problems about driving in bad weather is we always think of losing traction. But fog is not a traction problem. Fog is actually a vision problem. We have a tendency to drive faster than what we can see in fog. And fog usually happens early morning, late afternoons, and usually around bodies of water or where there's some water uh, around. Um, let's take a look at what to do driving in fog. Fog is considered the most dangerous of all driving hazards. The best advice for driving in fog is don't. It's simply hard to see what's around you. If you must drive, then slow down and turn on your low beam headlights. The low beams help you to see and help others to see you. Driving instructor Zandrea Baldwin emphasizes to use low beams, not high beams. If you have your high beams on, the glare is going to come back toward you from the fog. The fog is pretty much like a light, and if your light is shining against the fog, it's going to glare back into your, to your um, windshield, and it could actually cause temporary blindness. Because of the reduced visibility, it's vitally important to slow down and stay slowed down. Also, Use the right edge of the road as a guide rather than the center line. This can help you to avoid running into oncoming traffic or from becoming distracted by oncoming headlights. And don't be too proud to ask for help. Get your passengers involved. Have the passengers help you out checking blind spots and things of that nature for you. If the fog gets really thick, signal and pull off the road to a protected area. Then wait for the fog to let up. While pulled over, turn on your emergency flashers to make your car more visible to others. A final note, whatever you do, don't stop in the middle of the roadway, no matter how thick the fog is, that almost guarantees that someone will hit you from behind. Again, it's best not to drive in the fog at all. If you have to, stay alert. I'm Katina McHenry. So driving in the fog, as long as you're going a, a decent speed and stay to the right edge of the road near that, what we call the fog line, you're going to basically be okay. Remember to have those um, headlights on low. should never have high beams that will reflect back to you. And when you see other vehicles on the road, you want to be going slower until you really get a good grasp of where they're located. It's very hard to judge speed in the fog. This is what makes lane changes uh, so difficult or merging because you've got to see a vehicle and, and know its speed. Be ready for quick stops because you could have um, cars that can't see too well and when they do see something 
they're going to overreact and hit their brakes a little bit harder than normal. Um, and like they said at the end of the video clip here, if it's really, really heavy, pull over. Okay, preferably a parking lot, someplace that's safe, just not off the edge, because people will follow you. Meaning, if you don't put your emergency flashes on where they're blinking, um, if you just put your parking lights on, they may think you're still moving, and they'll just follow right up behind you and then realize you're stopped. Uh, fog has a tendency to dissipate relatively quickly, meaning that if it's really heavy within two or three minutes, it may it, it moves. If you've ever seen a lake or an ocean in the morning, there's fog coming off that body of water, and you can almost see it moving. So it's not going to stay that way the whole time. So if it's really bad, just pull over and, and just kind of wait just a bit and um, realize that it, it's a vision problem, not a traction problem. Here's an article that I got from USA Today. Um, the bottom picture is the one I like the most because it shows you all the cars that are piled up. And in the article, um, there's over 200 cars that ran into one another. Isn't that amazing? 200 cars driving in the fog could not stop because they were going too fast and their following distance was not correct for the speed that they were traveling. Okay, it is a major problem. Now, in the column to the right of the article, it talks about that they were only going 25 to 35 miles per hour. Now, once you think when you heard that 25, 35, you're thinking, then why'd they hit each other? That's really slow speed for a highway, 25, 35. Well, guess what? At 30 miles per hour, you know, you're going to need like, you know, probably like 70 feet to stop. Well, they could only see 55 feet in front of them. So if you can only see 55 feet in front of you and you need 70 feet to stop, where's the other 15 feet coming from? Well, it's in the front seat of the car that's right in front of you. That's why you're piling into cars that are in front of you because you need that extra distance to stop. So you have to have a good sense of what stopping distance is, especially when you're driving in bad weather, or you're going to learn the hard way and just keep on rear-ending people. The next, and the reading that I wanted you to do was chapter 13. So if you haven't done chapter 13 in the textbook, do that after tonight's class. It kind of covers a lot of what we're talking about tonight. And I will also put the uh, questions. I don't know if I've got them. I don't have them on Facebook right now. Um, so I'll either put them on tonight or tomorrow morning, and I will, again, send them out to the two of you that don't have Facebook. But uh, the questions, or review questions for Chapter 13 um, is important. So these three topics we do not experience here in New England. We do one of them a little bit, and I think it happened yesterday in Massachusetts. The three situations that uh, may... Um, arise when you move to another part of the country is uh, high winds. And I was talking to someone today that was driving and they told me a great story of a, of a tractor trailer that uh, blew over on Chesapeake Bay and uh, had an issue and the driver uh, drowned because he went, the truck went over the bridge. So we're going to see one on high winds in a moment. Then we're going to see one, a sandstorm and hail. And it was hailing in Massachusetts yesterday. So we're going to talk about uh, what to do. So let's take a look at the first one. Let's take a look at what it's like to uh, drive um, in high winds. What, what's the road going to be like? Okay, the thing that I want you to realize about driving in uh, high wind areas is never get side by side with these large vehicles. Because of their large center of gravity, and a lot of times these trucks aren't carrying loads right now. They don't have a load. So it's an empty truck. It's just a big, huge, you know, you know mass area. And that metal is not very heavy in the, in the, in the cab, I mean in the back. You would never think that you could tip a, a vehicle over. Notice the cars don't tip over. It's only the trucks. So stay back, stay away. 
that's my advice for driving in high winds so look at bridges uh, because the wind just whips over the over the water and Don't wide open it. areas like this okay. just be aware of wide open areas Okay, the next type of weather that I want you to be somewhat familiar with is driving when there's a sandstorm. And what a sandstorm, it's kind of like what we just saw with the high winds, but it picks up um, all the loose sand, especially in a desert area, so out in the southwest in the country here, that we may encounter this. Now, right now when the video starts, look how far you can see in front of you. Right now the picture is kind of dim, but you can probably see about, Oh, that's probably about a thousand feet in front of you up to the traffic light. Okay, let's see what it looks like driving. And I think the video is only like three minutes long. So watch this. It, bas it basically gets to be like driving at night. So it's still pretty light right now. So right now we're basically 20 seconds into the video. And, and it, it kind of almost look, looks like fog. So I would treat it just like fog where I go to the right lane, lower my speed, try to gauge the speed of vehicles a little bit better. Okay, we're now just in one minute into the video. So one minute into your drive, and this is what it's looking like. The camera can't even autofocus correctly now because it's like driving at night in fog, which is pretty dangerous. And, and just like fog, sandstorms don't last too, too long. And who knows, you may even come out of it too, depending on the turbulence of the wind. Okay, the last type of weather that I mentioned is driving in hail. And like I said, this happened in Worcester County in Massachusetts yesterday. Now, notice it's a wide open area. This is probably in the Midwest. The thing I want you to write down is look for an underpass, look for a gas station, look for a tree that you could drive under. I'd actually drive my car 30 feet, 40 feet off the road on the grass to get underneath the tree. I don't care what side of the road because you've got to get over quickly because if you don't, okay, the hail is going to just totally annihilate your, your windshield. Oh, and there's that beautiful wall cloud right in front of us. Um, now we're getting baseball size hail. Oh my gosh, bigger than baseball. Woo, we're getting close to grapefruits over here. And I got it on camera. Oh my gosh, we've got softball size hail going on. And I just got, yep, I'm okay. I just got glass all over me. We got to get out of this. Yep, that just happened. How are you able to get out of it? We don't no, just keep driving. That's all we can do. I have glass all over me. Don't move, don't move. I'm, if I'm going to. Oh my gosh. Yep, got that one too. Can we find a place to pull under? Oh my gosh, this is the biggest hell I've ever seen. Yeah, see his windshield is oh, just, oh, there's, there's no way you're going to be able to drive. I, I, what do you, want me to do? you just there's can't see. You can do, man. Pull up beside that building. We've lost our windshield. Um, uh, this is five to six inch size hail. I mean, it's bigger than softballs and grapefruits. I've never seen this big a hail in my life. I mean, that's, that's extreme. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, what type of weather do we encounter every month of the year? Rain. It can rain in December, January, February. It doesn't have to be snow in the wintertime. 
Uh, temperatures do stay relatively warm some years where we have temperatures of 50s and 60s uh, in December and January. So we're going to always drive in rain. And some of you have driven with in rain, I believe, with me. Um, a few of you have. So what I want you to write down is that it's really more of a visibility problem than traction. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to hydroplane when it rains. N hydroplaning doesn't happen that often. And usually it's a cause of two things. Like we said earlier tonight, it's usually the cause of high speed traveling and the water is too deep for your tire depth. So if you have poorly um, treaded tires, you've worn your tires down, you don't have good tread. And by the way, the only reason why you have tread on a car, a car's tire, is for bad weather. If you truly wanted to get the best traction on the roadway with your tire, it would be perfectly smooth, just like a race car. Look at all NASCAR tires. They don't have any tread. Not at that high speed. They want rubber on the road. So the only reason why we have grooves is to get rid of rain and snow. That's it. So if it is a traction problem, you're going too fast. Uh, rain can be a problem in the summertime when it mixes with grease from drippings from your car. So watch out for stop signs, traffic lights, parking spots when water drips or when oil drips onto the ground and then it starts to rain, it creates a, like a real slippery film for the first half hour. And then it basically gets pulled up and washes away. That's why we have our roads banked and crowned, is to get rid of some of this stuff. Here we are in fall, so wet leaves tend to pile up. It can be just as slippery as ice. So when you start getting, you know, two inches of heavy, you know, pound or, you know, leaves that are just packed down that's going to create a problem when you stop because you're gripping the top layer and the bottom layer is sticking to the pavement so you're going to slide headlights should always be on when it's raining that's a law in massachusetts not in new hampshire but i wouldn't be surprised if they pass it sometime in the next year or two so if your wipers are on you, you need your headlights in massachusetts if you don't you're going to get a ticket break early Okay, signal to give people an idea of what you're doing. And it's amazing how many people that drive do not know the difference between a pothole that has water in it and a puddle. There is a difference. Okay, a puddle gently brings you in and out of that area. Okay, it's very, very subtle. A pothole is very abrupt. It drops right down. It's almost like a, if you if you took a pot, I think that's where you get the, the name pot. Is you, if you took a cooking pot, you know that a cooking pot has a handle, but it drops right down, then it has a bottom, and then it comes back up on the other side. So your tire goes into that pot area, and you're going to ruin your alignment, or maybe even pop a tire. A puddle is more like um, a plate. A plate has, if you take a look at a dinner plate, it has a ridge. So if you were to have uh, something that was a little soupy, a little watery, like spaghetti or something, um, it doesn't go over the edges because you have a little bit of a lip to the plate. Well, the road has a little bit of a dip, and then it comes back up, and it can hold water. So that's a puddle. And try not to go through a puddle at its deepest point. So find the area of water and look for where the middle is. The middle will always be the deepest. All right, so remember that. Try to either uh, straddle a puddle or a pothole or go around it. Shouldn't hit either one. Look how easy it is to miss somebody in your side mirrors. So in between those red markings, those arrows, is a car. Then there's like two cars behind it. But you don't see the first one, not if you look real quick, because it's kind of blended in with all those droplets. And that's what makes um, mirrors so difficult in bad weather, because those droplets kind of distort what you see. I think the next vehicle that I get for driver's ed is going to have heated outside mirrors. 
I think that's going to be nice. I was looking at a car the other day that not only had heated outside mirrors, but it had heated windshield wipers. So it helps for de-icing the blades. Is there anything more aggravating driving in the wintertime when the ice accumulates on a windshield wiper blade? So these are all things that when you get, you know, buying a car, you, you may take for granted until you really want something like that to, to have in your vehicle to help you drive more efficiently and safely. Um, I don't think I have. I've got one on hydroplaning. Yep. Let's take a look at hydroplaning. The weather can present traffic hazards. Take rain. It's a hazard from the moment the first drops fall. This is when rain first mixes with oil and dust on the pavement. It's very slick. This is what happens. The dirt and oil float to the top of the water. So tires ride not only on the slippery surface of water, but also directly on the even more slippery surface of oil and dirt. It's no wonder so many crashes happen just after it starts raining. Eventually, dust and oil wash away but plenty of hazards remain. Rain, especially heavy rain, limits your ability to see. It's hard for you to see what's going on and it's hard for other people to see you. In addition to making it difficult to see, rain keeps roads slippery. Traction becomes a critical issue and hydroplaning, a real danger. Three main factors cause a car truck to hydroplane, speed, tread depth, and water depth. The faster your car or truck goes, the more traction you lose on a wet surface. The more worn your tires are, and the shallower the tread, the more likely your car is to hydroplane. Even a thin layer of water can cause your car to lose traction. But as the water gets deeper, you lose traction sooner. It all happens in a space no bigger than the bottom of a size 9 shoe. Now picture this, it's a smooth roadway, there's moderate rain, and you're traveling at 60 miles per hour. Under these conditions, each tire has to move away about one gallon of water every second. All in a space no bigger than this shoe. Each gripping element of the tread is on the ground even less time, one fiftieth of a second. During this fleeting moment, the gripping element must move the water from beneath the tire and then grip the road surface. If this doesn't happen, your car may likely hydroplane. When a car hydroplanes, the most important thing that someone needs to remember is don't panic. First, do not brake or accelerate suddenly. Since hydroplaning is a loss of traction to the front tires, sudden braking on a front or rear wheel drive slows the front tires but locks the rear tires. This can cause a spin out. Also, sudden acceleration on a front or rear wheel drive may take the vehicle straight ahead. This could be dangerous if the vehicle is pointed toward the edge of the roadway. According to some driving experts, what you should do depends on the type of vehicle you're in. Listen for the type of vehicle you drive. A front-wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. Front-wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. A rear-wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. If you begin to hydroplane in one of these types of cars, then some driving experts suggest you do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Stay lightly on the accelerator and steer gently toward the open space which you have identified. If you are in a rear wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system, then do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Ease off the accelerator and steer towards the open space which you have identified. Traction control systems, by the way, have been installed in vehicles for a number of years now, but everyone may not be familiar with. This is a system that prevents tires from spinning under acceleration. If your vehicle has a traction control system, there should be an icon indicating so on your dashboard. Another note, it's important not to have the cruise control engaged in the heavy rain due to a sudden acceleration problem. The vehicle will recognize the water buildup as a slowdown and ask for more power. This need for more power may shift, causing the vehicle to shift to a lower gear and build more water under the tires. This causes a cycle of more power and more push on the front tires. You can avoid hydroplaning by making sure the tread on your tires is thick enough and by slowing down. Here's a good rule of thumb for checking your tread. Stick a penny upside down in your tread 
If Lincoln's head is hidden, then your tread is thick enough. If the tread doesn't hide Lincoln's head, then your tread is too thin and you need new tires. When it comes to speed on a wet road, slow down by about one third of what you would normally drive. For example, if you normally drive 60 miles per hour on a dry highway, slow down to 40 when it's wet. So those are good tips to follow for driving um, in wet weather and hydroplaning. So hydroplaning is basically when your tires are riding on top of a layer of water. It usually doesn't happen at speeds below 35, it's above 35. And if you do hydroplane, as I said, it's usually speed related. And if you are hydroplaning, there is no braking, no accelerating, no steering. So the minute your car gets contact with the roadway again, it's going to react to what you're telling the car to do. So if you're accelerating while you're hydroplaning, the minute your tires hit pavement, you're going to go a lot faster. Or if you are hitting the brakes, the minute you hit pavement, you're going to brake real quick. Or your car is going to steer or turn in the direction you got your tires moved when it starts to hydroplane. So what should you do? Reduce your speed during heavy rain, slushy conditions. Reduce your speed near standing water or puddles because you just got to get traction. Make sure your tires are replaced, and that's why we have inspection. Um, like I said, November, December is a good time to, you know, check your car again. Even if it doesn't have to be inspected, let's say you were born in June. Okay, you're not up for inspection, but November, December might be a good idea to have a mechanic take a look at your tires. Keep going at a steady speed. Steering straight ahead. Take your foot off the accelerator if you think you're hydroplaning because you want the car to slow itself down. Just the weight and the mass of your vehicle, your car will slow down even if you are hydroplaning. Driving at night. So we've got a few things that we need to cover here. The first one is that more people are dying at night driving than they do during the day. And the biggest problem, there are three categories of people. Young people, because they're out on the road, Okay, driving fast, so your age group is dying at night because you can't drive during the day. You're in school. So most everything is like 4.35 o'clock. And by the way, it's going to be dark 4.35 o'clock in the next month. So that's what we call it. Nighttime driving doesn't have to be 9 o'clock at night. Nighttime driving can be 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. If you've got your headlights on, okay, and it's dark, it's nighttime. Uh, so you've got your young people, you've got older people that don't have good reaction and poor vision, and then you've got your drunk or drug drivers. These are the people that are dying at night. So at nighttime, we really can't see the road as well. Our peripheral vision is really cut down. This is why it's so wise to use your high beams in areas that you're not familiar with. Overdriving your headlights means that you're driving to a point when something does get illuminated with your headlights, you don't have a chance to stop for it. So let's say that your headlights shine about 150 feet, 200 feet. Well, if you need 225 feet, you're going to hit whatever is coming out in front of you because you don't have enough time. So high beams have been proven to shine about 350, low beams right around 100. Those two numbers might be a good thing to write down, especially for the final. And you need to know this. Guaranteed, this will be a question. The law states that headlights must be on a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise whenever your vision is limited. And the state will do everything on a multiple choice test to confuse you. They'll say a half hour before sunset to a half hour after sunrise. They'll say one hour after sunset to one hour rather than a half hour. So uh, you got to know it. You got to know it inside and out. So let's take a look at some driving tips for driving at night. From sunrise to sunset, drivers have a huge advantage in the sun. Although it's easy to take for granted, the sun makes it immensely easier for us to see. Once darkness falls, driving becomes a whole new ball game. There's no doubt about it. Driving is a lot dicier after the sun goes down. 
driving at night does present a whole new set of circumstances for um, any driver, young driver or an older driver. Darkness itself is a hazard. Even people with the best of vision cannot see as well at night. To begin with, your field of vision is less. You actually see a smaller amount of space. Objects are not as sharp, you can't perceive dips and rises as well, and you have a harder time distinguishing colors. A person with excellent vision still needs to remember to slow down and be aware of all the hazards that could present itself at night. You can only see as far ahead as your headlights shine. That makes it harder to see pedestrians, cyclists, animals, obstacles in the road. So go slowly enough so that you can stop within the distance lighted by your headlights. If it's safe, use your high beams, especially on open highways. But always know when to change to low beams. If you approach another car from behind, or if you meet an oncoming car, then switch to low beams. High beams blind other drivers and increase the likelihood of a crash. To avoid being blinded, don't look directly at oncoming headlights. Instead, look to the right edge of your lane and watch the oncoming car out of the corner of your eye. A couple of other brief points. Never drive with just your parking lights on. Parking lights are designed for parking. They're not a substitute for headlights. And keep your windshield and your headlights clean. It can get real dirty real quick. It's easy enough to do. I give them a quick wipe when I'm at the gas station. It helps reduce glare, it helps the lights to shine brighter, and in general, it helps you to see much better at night. This is Jim Angelo. So driving at night is gonna have some special problems. One is that the headlights coming at you are gonna just totally blind you. So make sure that you use the day-night adjustment underneath your rear view mirror. There's a little lever that you can flip up and that takes the reflection away from your eyes and throws that reflection up onto the top part of your vehicle. Now what happens with the cars that are coming towards you, not the ones that are coming behind you? Don't focus on the car that's coming towards you. Focus your eyes to the white line, that fog line, that edge line. That's going to keep your car off to the right give you your bearings that you need to be positioned on the road correctly, and it's going to take some of that brightness away. Now, the next topic is fatigue. We call it highway hypnosis. One car after another passes you with their headlights on, and you're getting lulled to sleep. I'm getting very tired, and you're going to start nodding off. The thing you need to remember is... Each time that you close your eyes, and you're, you're probably saying, there's no way I'm ever going to do this. But I will tell you, with I am 100% sure everybody's going to have this happen to them. I actually had someone yawning in the car today. You're going to close your eyes when you drive. It's going to be a split second, but then you're going to open them up, and then you're probably okay. But late at night, each time that you close your eyes, it's going to be for a little bit longer period of time. And you are going to lose your position on the roadway. And I know for a fact that every single one of you have watched TV at night and have fallen asleep watching TV. And when you wake up, you start wondering, did I just fall asleep for five seconds? Is it a minute? You look at your watch and it's like 20 minutes has gone by. How could you fall asleep? Um, it happens. Your body needs sleep. So there's something called circadian rhythm that your body, after a while, will just shut down. And it usually happens, um, of course, from the time that you normally go to sleep at night. But people are falling asleep behind the wheel between midnight and 6 in the morning and mid-afternoon. is more probably elderly people. But really what you got to do is, is, is get rest. If you're driving, see if there's another available driver in the car that will take over for you. Uh, stop someplace and get some caffeine, um, get some sugar, uh, play loud music, have people talk to you and see if you're responding so they can monitor what you're doing. But it's really, really important that you don't fall asleep. You don't think it's going to be that big of a deal, but then it happens. Let me show you this, this NBC report that they did on fatigue. It's crazy. Um, how you think you're awake, but you're still going to be a decent driver, but you're really tired. Watch this. 
Back at 744 this morning on Today investigates a serious hazard facing young drivers that is often overlooked. NBC's senior investigative correspondent Lisa Myers is in Bethesda, Maryland with details. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Meredith. We're talking about driving while tired. We've all done it, but experts say it's particularly dangerous for teens. Fatigue is a factor in at least 100,000 crashes every year, and most of those involve young drivers who get behind the wheel when they're drowsy and never make it home. I sit on a replay that night over and over and over again, and I thought, I'm just so close to home, I can make it. That night, Rusty Burris was 18 years old with a bright future. But driving home from his girlfriend's house, his life changed forever. I knew I was tired, but I didn't really feel that I was that tired. And driving home, I got just a mile from home and fell asleep at the wheel. In seconds, Rusty's car drifted off his country road and rolled over. The impact crushed his roof and his spine. Rusty would never walk again. I fallen asleep and crashed my car one time and that's all it took experts say every day millions of teens are dangerously tired when they get behind the wheel more than a third of teens say they drive drowsy on a regular basis and more than half of all fatigue related crashes involve drivers under 25. it's a huge problem and it's probably bigger now than it was in the past Tom Balkan is president of the National Sleep Foundation. He says adolescents go through changes in their circadian rhythms that make it nearly impossible for them to fall asleep before 11 p.m. Combine that with early morning classes, after school jobs, and late night socializing, and it's easy to see why teens are chronically sleep deprived. The average college student needs about eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. Virtually none of them get that. In fact, they average six hours of sleep per night. So how can fatigue affect their driving? Today's show, how may I help you? To find out, we set up an unscientific experiment with three Today Show interns, Patrick, Meredith, and Brian, all college students who habitually drive after not much sleep. Last summer, I was driving tired almost every day. When it's final season, there's no sleep. That's when the drowsy driving starts to kick in. For our experiment, we kept our kids up for an entire night, no naps or caffeine. Experts told us that would simulate the level of fatigue students typically suffer after a week of insufficient sleep. You don't want to hit a cone. Then we brought them here to the Skip Barber Driving School in Connecticut, where with safety instructors by their side, we put them through two road tests, a tight twisty loop and an emergency lane change. We're testing today their ability to instantaneously react to an unexpected situation. Hitting any cones would be the equivalent of a crash in the real world. The day before, all three had driven these courses wide awake and aced them. I haven't hit any cones, and I think it's not that hard. I feel pretty confident. Once you got the hang of it, it, was, uh, it wasn't that bad. But watch the difference when they're drowsy. Our kids swerve wildly through turns, hitting cone after cone after cone. If that had been a real-world situation, he would have had a pretty violent crash. Inside the car, you'd never know it. Even as they crash, our drowsy students remain slack-jawed and dazed. Patrick clearly is giddy. He, he almost seems drunk. In many ways, driving drowsy is very much like dri driving drunk. We showed the video to Tom Balkan, our sleep expert. He says drowsiness, like alcohol, can severely impair a driver's reflexes, judgment, and awareness. Should parents be as worried about kids driving when they're too tired as they are about them texting while driving or driving drunk? Absolutely. Especially, he says, on long, boring roads like the one where Rusty crashed. So we also tested our kids on this monotonous two-mile track each driving it for half an hour. At first I thought I did okay. You know, I thought I was in control. But their dead stares tell a different story. Balkan says these are signs of a dangerous condition called microsleeps, where your eyes stay open, but your brain is falling asleep. And this is the kind of situation where uh, anything uh, unexpected actually could throw them. Like these surprise cones. 
We put them up on our kids' final lap to simulate a stopped car or a person unexpectedly in their path. Before the test, we made sure an alert driver could easily stop in time. But watch our drowsy kids. Whoa! They're so disoriented, they barely hit the brakes. Whoa, okay, that was fun. <laughs> I just killed somebody, didn't I? Imagine if that cone had been someone's pet or child. After I sat there for a minute and realized what I did, that's a tough pill to swallow. That was an eye-opener because that thing that you never know is going to happen that will just come out of nowhere. That's what you have to be prepared for. And if you're tired, you might not be. A realization that came too late for Rusty Burris. When you're tired, stop. Don't push it. Because even though you've only got a mile left, you could be throwing your entire life away trying to drive one more mile. Now, sleep e experts say parents should treat drowsy driving just like drunk driving. Tell your kid if he's tired to call you, you'll come pick him up. Or if he gets tired on a long drive, tell him to pull off the road, get some caffeine, and take a 20-minute nap. That should help revive him. Meredith? All right, Lisa Myers, thank you. So you can see it's a real, a real issue. Even though they had stayed up all night long and they were wide awake, they were still really late on their reaction to responding to the turns. And notice when the cones, where they came up over a hill, this is why hitting um, uh, pedestrians is such a common thing for people that are tired. And as they said in the video, I want you to write this down in your notes, is that fatigue driving, your reactions are just like a drunk, excuse me, a drunk driver. The thing is a drunk driver is looking at the road and trying to drive well. A person that's falling asleep doesn't realize that he's falling asleep and he doesn't see the road at all. So your behavior is going to look just like a drunk driver. Car companies are doing um, uh, different things, and I'm not going to show the video clip on this. It's just that we've got lane departures now. So when you go out of your lane, um, there's going to be a little, you know, ringing or a bell going off inside the vehicle indicating that you're not staying in your lane. Uh, automatic braking, if you get too close, there's a radar in the front of the car that senses that you're getting too close to your following distance and it's going to brake the car for you. Um, um, you may experience some of the situ situations that we talked about tonight after you get your license for the first time when you don't have an instructor in the car or your parents in the car. So hopefully tonight you learned a few things. Hopefully you'll put this into your um, driving repertoire um, and you practice it over the years because I believe it will make you a better driver. Uh, know what you're able to do and what you can't do. So know your driving skill. Just because you're going to be getting a license and it says you're a licensed driver doesn't mean that you're necessarily an expert. doesn't mean that you're not going to have issues and problems. So don't be too proud to ask for help. Like someone else want to drive tonight. I've never really driven in this. Um, plan on doing things at a different date and time. So don't be a hero. So always practice on the side of caution. And the other thing is, even though a crash may not be your fault, it's going to affect you physically and emotionally. You're going to be a little bit gun shy next time you get behind the wheel of the car because you're going to think it's going to happen again getting hit on the side or hitting from behind. And you're going to be without your car for a while while it gets fixed. So that's kind of a bad thing. So just try to uh, be smart when it comes to bad driving. And that brings us right to the end. So chapter 13 is what I wanted you to read in the textbook. Let me get out of here. Let me get me back on the screen. Okay, so chapter 13 is what I wanted you to read. I don't know if I can get it online uh, for homework tonight, but I will send it out for you tomorrow uh, at some point. Uh, so just have it done before next uh, class next week. Um, please text me if you can drive. I saw someone, um, Julie and I will text you after class and uh, see if you can uh, take a time on Saturday. But if you can, please try to sign up for times. Uh, especially give me what you're able to do for next week um, because I want to start booking up my, uh, my week. I'm not driving on Monday, um, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, tell me what your availability is because we are into fourth, our fourth week next week. Uh, also, read ahead. Uh, chapter, I don't have it in front of me. It is chapter 18 in the textbook. It, we're going to be dealing with alcohol and drugs. 
on Tuesday and Wednesday. So please, um, so please, you know, do your reading. Uh, some of you are a little bit behind on some of your homework, so stay on top of things. Well, I think that's it for tonight. Uh, I have a surprise little guest here in my house. My granddaughter came to visit me, so I'm going to go spend a little bit of time with my granddaughter. So do your homework, do your reading. Um, have a great weekend. It's a long weekend. You have no school tomorrow. Yay. So thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we'll see you next uh, Tuesday if we don't drive. Have a good night.